So my name is Nazish. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm trying to fill in for Dr. Wu, who's the CVI director. So uh, in the next 12 minutes, I will try to make you guys the jury. You decide whether cell therapy is the silver bullet or it is a fool's gold. Uh, I'll give my two cents in it, and then you guys can make the decision. So, uh, well, I don't have any disclosures except for uh, NHLBI funding and uh, the CERM funding. So how do we treat patients? I mean, we treat patients, I mean, we've been talking since morning by either surgery, uh, we have drugs which could uh, uh, you know, help in uh, heart failure, devices uh, are there to improve uh, cardiac health, antibodies, uh, gene therapy has been around, but you know, what I want to talk today about is, is that we can use stem cells, either adult stem cells or uh, iPSCs, the embryonic stem cells, to cure uh, heart failure, of, you know, ischemic, non-ischemic. Um, and indeed, there has been quite a bit of uh, adult stem cell therapy out there. You could see how uh, uh, bone marrow-derived mononuclear cells have been used to uh, treat uh, heart failure. Adipose tissue is known to secrete certain growth factors, which can improve... Uh, you know, uh, heart function after myocardial injury and so on and so forth. Even cardiac progenitor cells have been used uh, to improve uh, 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 cardiac health. So, you know, in, in long, long time ago, about a thousand ships were sailed to get Helen back. And uh, a thousand ships means, uh, you know, a, a lot of troops went there. And then in 2001, one image uh, launched a thousand investigations, you know, millions of dollars were spent in it. Uh, this uh, work by uh, Dr. Piero Versa's group showed that uh, bone matter mononuclear cells can improve, you know, quite a bit, uh, almost up to about uh, 40, 50 percent of the injured myocardium. And, you know, uh, this seminal work led to a lot of investigations, clinical trials, and I can keep going. I'm just going to show a, a very few of them. And you could see right here that uh, bone matter mononuclear cells were used for so many clinical trials, uh, you know, ranging from six-month study to five-year studies. And the outcome, more or less, was the same. I mean, it showed only modest uh, left ventricular ejection fraction improvement. You know, I mean, the studies kept going on. Uh, they were used for non-ischemic uh, myocardial injury, or they were used for heart failure either due to, you know, mutations or either due to uh, obesity, and all had almost around the same uh, outcome, which was only modest improvement in uh, ejection fraction. You use uh, bone marrow mononuclear cells, either they were given through the coronary artery, or they were injected transendocardial. So the outcome was almost the same. And... Uh, indeed, you know, uh, NHLBI has given a lot of uh, uh, funding for this thing, and CCTRN, which Stanford is one of the recipients, is shown that, you know, uh, intracoronary or endocardial injection of bone marrow, bone, bone marrow mononuclear cells uh, ha has very modest or actually does not have any effective uh, improvement in the patient's uh, ejection fraction, which is usually used as the uh, cut off to, you know, see whether the heart has improved or not. So uh, when we summarize this thing from the last 2001, 2005 to due date, what we have seen is that there is no improvement. And what is happening? Why we are not seeing any improvement in this thing? And uh, even though these stem cells are shown to get into the heart, but there's no improvement in the uh, 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 patient's uh, outcome. So how can we design better trials using stem cells? And this could be because of patient variability. I mean, uh, you could see right here in this figure, even the placebo has so much variation in uh, end systolic volume. And, you know, when these are given bone, uh, the uh, stem cells, even more variations exist. So, you know, this is not preci precision medicine. It's just you see so much variability among patients. So is it because it's a bad delivery? I mean, are we giving the cells the wrong way? I mean, maybe intracoronary is not the way of transendocardial. Or is it because of bad cellular engraftment? I mean, are they going into the heart and are they homing where we want them to home? So, uh, you know, a part of our uh, study was to find out whether it's the delivery system which is a problem. So. Uh, you know, our lab ran a small clinical trial, a small 40 patients, where 20 were randomized for uh, intracoronary, 20 were 
randomized for uh, uh, trans uh, endocardial, and we found that actually uh, trans endocardial uh, delivery of CD31, CD34 cells was better in these small cohort of patients compared to the intracoronary artery. So it may be, bad, you know, some of the studies were using bad delivery system. And then comes the uh, question of bad engraftment. So, you know, if you look at these cells, only the cells which were homing were actually improving uh, the function uh, of these patients. So it is basically could be that we're looking at the bad delivery system or the bad engraftment system. And then the question comes, is it bad data analysis? Are we using the right statistical methods to look at these patients and see whether they are improving or not? And the next question is, it's a bad cell type. I mean, we are injecting millions of uh, bone marrow mononuclear derived cells, but maybe 80% of them are bad, and only 20% of them are gonna go and home. And you could see right here in this figure that only the cells which were viable were homing into the uh, in fact, infarcted myocardium. So it is because uh, when you combine all of these factors, bad cell type, bad engraftment, maybe we are doing it completely wrong. And that's why we're not seeing any, any data out of this thing. And then the question comes, which I think is the most important, are we looking at the bad patient population? And this is where I will try to switch it and bring in uh, uh, the stem cell thing that you know, usually, and I'm, I'm glad that nobody over here is representing this car. You know, we're all young over here. So, you know, usually a, a, a typical 70-year-old patient is a 1940 car model where it has all the, hyper, all the uh, bad effects, hypertension, CAD, and then when we put the autologous adult stem cells, we're putting a bad muffler into this, so probably it's not gonna work. I mean, maybe it will run for a couple of miles, and then it's gonna break down. And that's when we think, if we take the uh, pluripotent stem cells, if we can derive either embryonic stem cells or iPSCs, which is induced pluripotent stem cells, maybe in this old car, we can put a new muffler, which maybe it might able to run for 100 miles. So that's where the switch I would like to make is that Embryo, uh, stem cell, rather than adult, or, but embryonic induced pluripotent stem cells is the way to go. And there's a clinical trial which, uh, which ran in 2015. Uh, it was uh, the embryonic stem cell derived uh, uh, RPE therapy for vascular degeneration and showed improvement, a modest improvement in these. However, embryonic stem cell has a lot of ethical issues. Uh, so the, the question is that, do we want to use embryonic stem cell derived cells? Uh, but another problem was that ESCs were isolated way back in 1998. This trial ran in 2012, so we had about 14 years to develop the system, overcome some of the ethical issues, so that can be used in clinical trials. But then Yamanaka came up with this, and Jamie Thompson came up with this uh, using uh, skin cells induced pluripotent stem cells derived from these fibroblasts, which was used for RPE. And you could see that in 2007, the discovery of iPSCs, and in 2014, the first iPSC clinical trial. So we did it in half amount of time because ethical issues were not used. Uh, the technology was much better in that uh, 10 years, which was used. And then, you know, coming back to the heart, uh, the first trial in France is being run where iPSC-derived uh, cardiac progenitor cells are being laced on a fibrin patch, which will be put into the patients so that they can improve and look at the ejection fraction. Uh, the first paper came out where they showed that there was an improvement. However, it was just one patient, and the patient also had undergone um, a surgical improvement. So we really don't know whether it was iPSC-derived cardiac progenitor cells or whether it was the cabbage which was performed. So it's all good that we know we can use iPSCs or embryonic stem cells to repair heart, but you know, we, we're gonna run into a lot of clinical hurdles in this. If you could see in the figure on the, on the right, from recruiting these patients to deriving these iPSCs and then differentiating them to cardiomyocytes, this is a month-long process. I mean, I'm not even counting into the IRB process and all the other clinical hurdles. This may take a long, long time. And I hope that this process could be 
overcome by having a more fundamental and more generalized protocol of recruiting patients and differentiating to uh, cardiomyocytes. And we're trying to do that at Stanford. We have a, a CIRM-funded project where we're taking uh, human embryonic stem cells and we are deriving uh, cardiac cells. These are beating cardiomyocytes, millions and millions of cells. And then we have tried to finish some preclinical studies in mice and pigs, and now we're trying to get an IND so we can put it in LVAD patients to see whether there is an improvement in the infarcted heart when these patients undergo a heart transplant and we get access to the heart. So we are in the initial stages of this, uh, in this Stanford SOM project, but there's, there are many challenges which we are gonna see. First challenge is tumorigenicity. Uh, main thing is these iPSCs derive from skin. We use Sendai viruses, even though these viruses do not integrate, uh, we really don't know whether there might be one cell which still might be remaining. One cell is bad because even that can lead to tumorigenicity. So we want to make sure that there is no tumorigenicity from these iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes. The second question is immunogenicity. These are uh, allogenic, so we need to make sure that these cells are not rejected by the, uh, the patient, even though they are derived from the same individual. So we, when I have uh, put a bunch of papers which we are trying to figure out the tumorigenicity, the immunogenicity problems. Uh, but the main thing, I think, is the switching of the gears from preclinical models to clinical trials. Number one, it's very expensive. I mean, uh, these preclinical models are $150 a day to keep, uh, keep them inside the lab. So uh, the f and NIH usually do not fund these things because they're not mechanistic. So I think this is one of the biggest challenges, if you can show in the preclinical, is how we can translate these preclinical models into a clinical trial. Um, so what I'll try to summarize is that there are challenges in stem cell therapy, uh, challenges such as immunogenicity, tumorigenicity, but we are making good progress towards using these patients' own derived iPSC cardiomyocytes to be transplanted back into the same patient so we can still use the precision medicine which was announced and also able to cure the same patient. And uh, this is just... Uh, a summarized figure of how we can improve cell survival in these patients by combining uh, Im imaging technology, combining tissue engineering technology such as fibrin patches, which can improve the cardiac health. So now I said I'll give you my two cents. Uh, pretty much whatever cells we inject in are going to get rejected. I would say about 99% of these cells which we're going to inject are going to die within four to six months. So really, are we doing anything by improving this uh, in the patient. The second question is the dosing. Usually patients are given drugs for life. I mean, if they have pneumonia, they're given an antibiotic for 10 days. If they have congestive heart failure, they're given lifelong medications. So do we expect that a one-time dose, even if it's a billion cardiomyocytes from the same patient, would improve the heart function. It's either from an ischemic heart disease or a non-ischemic heart disease. So it's not really there. We really don't know what the dosing is gonna be on. And it's very hard to expect that a, a single dose will improve the heart function. So that's something which we need to, to figure out. Uh, the second question is that most adult stem cells is about, two, two, about two, 20 to 200 million cardiomyocytes. Now that's pretty hard, I mean, we, if we get one dish, that's only about half a million cardiomyocytes. So we need an industrial size production of these cardiomyocytes to be injected into this patient. And even if we have one cell which is tumorigenic, the entire system fails apart because we want a clean, uh, non-immunogenic, non-tumorigenic cells going into the cell. So, uh, as I said, my two cents that I think it's not a silver bullet. Uh, right now, maybe a fool's goal, but maybe we can, with you know, concerted effort from the community, m make it a, a, a silver bullet. With that, I'd like to thank my director, Dr. Wu. Uh, we are a very translational lab. Uh, using stem cells, we look for drug discovery. Uh, we do a lot of translational work, which you just saw. That'll take any questions, or maybe we can do it after.